Nature has always worked with ease. Millions of gallons of water are transported thousands of miles, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. This water is moved across deserts, over mountains, and even between continents. It is all done without pumps, electricity, or the need for fossil fuels. The entire planet, almost 200 million square miles of it, is run with solar energy. Nothing is wasted, everything is recycled. Yet when it comes to designing our buildings, we take it for granted that our structures need mechanical heating and cooling systems. We take it for granted that energy is piped and wired into our homes and offices, and that we have an electric bill every month. We take it for granted that we must pump oil and gas from the ground, that power plants pollute, that our cars pollute, and that our skies are clouded with smog. It is simply the price we must pay for the convenience our technology offers. Or is it? What if, through changes in our building designs, we could start moving towards extremely energy-efficient buildings that generate much of their own pollution-free power? What if these buildings actually saved us money in their operation? What if your home generated more power than it needed and could actually sell this power back to the utility company? These buildings are not concepts for tomorrow. They are being built today, and implementing this kind of change may be easier than you think. This is working with instead of against nature. This is Building with Awareness. Hybrid structures are constructed using a wide variety of materials. In Corrales, New Mexico, just on the outskirts of Albuquerque, designer Ted Owens designed and built his own house using both conventional and progressive building techniques. It balances the best of both worlds by generating electricity with high-tech photovoltaic panels on the roof, while using low-tech straw bale and adobe walls for stabilizing interior temperatures. Despite the structure's small footprint of 800 square feet, each room feels spacious and bright. By building the home no larger than was needed, money could be put into aesthetic elements instead of square footage. Detail and design were as important as energy efficiency. The choice of materials was based on their visual appeal, ease of use, energy efficiency, and the amount of embodied energy. That is, the amount of energy it took to actually manufacture the material. Windows were positioned so that natural light would filter into the entire living space from at least two sides of each room. In addition, they were carefully placed to ensure good ventilation and also to direct the eye to the outdoors from key vantage points. This design technique is useful in opening up small spaces visually, thereby making the rooms appear larger than they really are. I built this house as kind of an experiment. It was to see what it was truly like to work with sustainable and green materials what kind of difficulties there might be in the process of working with them, and what worked really well and would be very easy for any person to incorporate into their own structure if they happen to be building one. The opportunities for combining low technology with the high technology, to me, it's really exciting. I mean, you have these materials like straw and mud, and you're combining them with very high-tech materials like silicon photovoltaic cells on the roof that are converting sunlight into electricity. One thing I found that was quite nice and quite a nice balance to building with sustainable materials is that there's a beautiful aesthetic to it. It's a very soft aesthetic. It's, it's very different. Walls are straight, but not totally straight. There's kind of a handmade quality to things. Unlike wallboard and frame construction, which is what the majority of all houses are made out of today, you have to be absolutely precise. You've got to have 90 degree angles. Your wallboard has to be 
flush with the next piece that it butts up against or else the whole aesthetic falls apart. I mean, you get cracks and bumps and it just doesn't look right because you're dealing with a very hard angular material. With natural materials, you can actually form these walls with your bare hands. You kind of warp things into position because it's all kind of pliable and flexible like clay. I mean, the adobe, literally, you can stack the adobe bricks, put in subtle curves. The corners, you can actually come in after the fact and, and sand them to nice radiuses, and you don't have to be stuck with the hard edges. Since my background is as a designer, obviously the aesthetics had to play a very important part of this. And I think this is actually something that is sometimes forgotten or missed in sustainable design that if the house is not aesthetic or the building or whatever it is you're making, it's probably not going to last as long. You need to have structures that feel good, that look good visually. And this is something I think is missing quite often in our cities and towns today, particularly in houses. I think one of the biggest challenges if you're going to build your own house out of green materials, it's the research stage. There's always going to be compromises. There's no one material that is always going to be better than one over the other. Straw bale is a great material. However, if you have to import it a thousand miles by truck, maybe that isn't quite as sustainable as something else that might be available in your area. The other material I chose that was very important to use for thermal mass on the inside was adobe. Adobe in this area in New Mexico is very easy to obtain. It's locally produced and it's a very easy material to work with. The wall covering in this house is actually mud, and I mean pure mud right out of the ground. For large dimensional lumber, that is anything over six by six inches, we always used recycled wood and made an effort to feature it in the construction. By doing this, we were able to have the aesthetic advantage of heavy timbers without cutting down old growth trees. I obtained this lumber from either salvage yards or local renovation projects being done by friends. Winter temperatures here can dip into the mid-teens at night and only reach the mid-40s during the day. More than half the heating needs of this home can be supplied by taking advantage of sunlight alone. Through careful planning and design, we can take full advantage of sunlight and temperature swings, having them work for us instead of against us. Even small differences in construction techniques can lead to great improvements in energy efficiency and savings. For example, by simply rotating the angle of the structure a few degrees, so that the majority of the windows face south. The homeowner can potentially save thousands of dollars in energy costs. As the low winter sun moves across the sky from east to west, solar energy sweeps across the interior surfaces of the home through the south-facing windows. Sunlight is energy, and when it hits the darker colored walls and floor, this light energy is converted into heat just as the interior of your car warms up on a sunny day. The heavy mass of the adobe walls and the concrete floor then act as a storage medium for this heat. This is called thermal mass. These heavy materials warm up under the sun and then slowly release the stored heat back into the room during the night. It is a simple and elegant system. With all its thermal mass and insulation, the interior temperature rarely changes more than three degrees during a 24-hour period, even when the backup mechanical heating system is not being used. In cold weather, windows on the north side will only drain the home of heat. Therefore, they are kept small and to a minimum. They are just big enough to add some interior light and to assist in summer cross ventilation. The west side of the house has only one window. Any glass in this wall will allow the late afternoon summer sun to overheat the inside of the house. Two openings at opposite ends of the ceiling create cross ventilation to eliminate trapped heat. In Albuquerque, 
the temperature on summer days will average around 90 degrees. Evenings, however, are pleasantly cool. This cooler night air, along with the thick adobe interior walls and the highly insulative exterior straw bale walls, will keep the home comfortable during the day. This is accomplished by opening windows at night in order to cool down the thermal mass. In the morning, the windows are again shut in order to keep out the heat of the day. The east side has three small windows. A portal shades this side of the house, so there is a bit more flexibility in determining the size and number of windows here. The kitchen window is large enough to take advantage of the scenic mountain view, while the loft and bathroom windows are used primarily for ventilation and light. As with any structure, the design starts on paper. On paper, both the aesthetic and solar aspects can be manipulated and evaluated. Spending time in the sketch and design stage is one of the most important phases of constructing a home. This is an overall floor plan of the house as we're going to build it. And as you can see, all of the exterior walls are made out of straw bale. Those are 18 inches thick, and this gives us very high insulation in the exterior walls to keep the heat of the summer out and the cold of the winter out. All the interior walls of the house are adobe. This is indicated by the orange areas. It's very important to get as much thermal mass, which means thick, heavy walls made out of something like adobe or stone, within your outer shell of highly insulated walls. Thermal mass on the inside, straw bale on the outside is the best combination for reducing your heating and cooling needs. Sometimes even in solar houses, they leave out the interior thermal mass walls, which is actually very inefficient because these interior walls are not only releasing stored heat in the winter, but also absorbing excess heat in the summer. This is the south side of the house, and here's our entry through a portal, then through an entry hall, and into the main living area. This section here is the dining room area, and then there's an 18-inch rise in the floor that makes up the living room area. Either section alone would be too small for an actual living space, but since they're softly divided with a three-foot high wall and a bookshelf, the overall area feels very generous in its size. Kitchen is here, and then on the north side where we're not using it as much and so heat isn't quite as important, we have a storage closet area back here, a utility room that includes a washing machine, and then this section here is the bathroom. And right off the portal, we have the mechanical room. And this room contains tankless hot water heater, a pressure tank for the well, and also a standard hot water heater which heats the radiant floor heat. Now this is divided by a frame wall, one of the only frame walls within the house. And this wall is framed because we're running plumbing through there. Note that the mechanical room is directly adjacent to both the bathroom and the kitchen sink. This makes for very short runs of the hot water line to both the bathroom sink, the shower, and the kitchen sink. This saves both water and energy in heating the water. The battery room is also on the north side with access only from the outside. And this area here, above the kitchen and the entry hall, this is a loft. This is a cutaway view of what the house looks like if you're actually to just cut it right down the center of the house. You can see the thickness of the two foot thick adobe wall that divides the living area from the closet area. You can also see the thickness of the truss area that will have insulation in it. This also shows the thickness of the straw bale wall, which you can see here, which is about 18 inches wide. Here's the glass window on the south side. Now in the winter, the sun is very low on the horizon, and this line here shows how the winter sun comes just in under the eave of the roof, underneath the window, and goes about three quarters of the way into the living area of the living room. So this whole area here is collecting solar energy. Now in the summer, you don't want any direct sunlight to come in. And the way the sun actually works in the summer, the sun comes in from a very high angle from up above. So in the summer, the sun angle is coming from about here. And therefore, there's no direct sunlight at all coming into the house. Winter sun angle, summer sun angle. Solar energy entering the house, solar energy totally cut from the house. 
I'm a designer professionally and not really a builder. So I got to admit it was, it was very intimidating to come up with the idea that, okay, you're going to build your own house. Um, before I started this structure, I think the largest thing I'd ever built was probably a fort in my neighbor's backyard when I was five years old. So there's definitely busting through that mental barrier of just getting going on the project and you build until it's done. This home will be 100% owner built and contracted. Among the core crew members, in addition to Ted, will be his father, Al Owens, a retired electrical and mechanical engineer in the communications satellite field. Although he is quite skilled using power tools for home repair projects, this will be his first experience actually building a house from the ground up. Tom Carson, a friend and neighbor, is just finishing his degree in architecture at the University of New Mexico. Tom will act as the key construction consultant and will work part-time through all phases of building the house. Okay, good. Although he has been very involved in conventional wood frame construction, Capping. this will be his first experience using alternative building materials. No, I know, but... Mark Steinkamp is also an architecture student with a background in conventional construction. He will help out as needed during the framing, roofing, and straw bale phases of the project. This will also be his first experience with alternative materials. The first thing we built was a workshop, which will be in lieu of a garage. This allowed us to experiment with building materials and techniques, which would be later used in the construction of the house itself. These included the rubble trench foundation, adobe walls, and cob infill on the gable ends. 